So yes, I am Logan Smith, CTO of Argyle. Uh, we focus on that one-to-one uh, -one overlay of data onto the construction sites um, and frontline workers in general, really trying to get that consistent alignment piece, which led to the invention of RISA, um, which I'm actually gonna talk about a little bit more. Um, first of all, just welcome. Thank, thank you for being here. I'm excited to see a room full of people coming for what would be kind of an esoteric topic. Uh, I'm guessing that there's a lot of people in here that don't have clients or customers in space. Um, but that, that brings us to then what are we doing here? And I think the best that we can do here with an XR alignment track is say, okay, let's look at this as a case study and think through by, by pushing how we do our development to target an extreme environment, like designing for space use, then uh, how does that inform how we build our apps, even if they are terrestrial use cases? So the issues I wanna go through are basically the assumptions that we have, because essentially all the AR that we're making now, almost none of it would work outside of an Earth-based environment. So we have a series of assumptions. And I wanna go through those and see how like all of these are solvable. Uh, and so we can be able to move past these assumptions. The first is, I'll just put in the broad category of um, acceleration. So to talk about this, we need to get into first like a, a, a review or introduction to how these devices know where they are in space from second to second. Um, and that's a few different ways. The first, the quickest one is a sensor that every AR device has within it, accelerometer, IMU, there's some varieties and, and different names, but essentially, that's a sensor that works like your inner ear to detect your movement, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, and rotation about each one of those, making the pitch roll and yaw. And these sensors are really fast, and so they can serve up those you know, jerky movements of suddenly looking one direction or another, and at a good frame rate, be able to update that hologram projection so that you can always see it in its proper place. But those are not adequate for um, any kind of long-term use. They're very, very good at the latency, not good at accuracy over time. So uh, we introduced SLAM. Pretty much every one of these devices are going to have a visual uh, system for looking through the camera, finding these feature points, and let's say this is what the camera is seeing, it's going to find high contrast feature points at every one of these spots. And then frame by frame, it's going to see those feature points moving and be able to pretty accurately estimate its position relative to those feature points and how that position changes over time. That gets us to the point where within a room or so, we can track our movement for sort of a reasonable session. Um, then if you need to get longer distance and longer sessions, that's why we at Argyle built RISA, which consistently on a loop goes and checks with these known points uh, over time to correct anything that SLAM and IMUs put together um, haven't been able to keep track of. Um, so that gets us to our big problem here, is that right off the bat, this IMU is built assuming that stationary actually means acceleration at 9.8 meters per second squared, going straight up. And that's what we're all doing right now. We're all accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. 
and we have to basically um, account for that when we're developing these, these sensors and these devices and say, okay, just assume that's always true. Um, trouble is when it's not. You can see this if you wear a HoloLens into an elevator, which I did last night and got a video if we need to reference it later, uh, of suddenly your holograms start flying up to the ceiling or flying down to the floor, depending on which way you're going, because they're listening for those accelerations second to second, uh, which leaves us with a problem. Suddenly, if we don't have that at all, if we go onto the ISS and are using our HoloLens, we're going to assume we're always falling off of a building. Um, because that's a neutral reference plane. So we have a few options here. The first is to just ignore the IMU sensor. That's going to be a problem because of that latency problem. SLAM just isn't quick enough to be able to keep your holograms looking steady and have you not get sick. The second is to set a new baseline to override the big problem we'll get into there is now we just have a new static problem, right? Okay, it worked on the ground, but it's not going to work on, in uh, orbit. So, okay, you change your assumption to be now it works in orbit. Okay, now Artemis takes it and lands on the moon, and now it doesn't work on the moon. Okay, well, what if you just turn on a low burn and you have a subtle acceleration? Now it doesn't work. If you have a spinning spacecraft to create artificial gravity, you walk up to the second floor and you have a different gravity on the second floor. So suddenly it's not working again. So that's really limited and you really haven't solved the problem long term. The third one that works really well, sorry, I keep turning it. Um, and it's pretty exciting because this is actually what Microsoft has started working on, is basically to have a dynamic adjustment. So it watches for that acceleration, compares it continuously to how it's tracking those feature points and adjusts its assumptions. There, there are limitations. You, you can accommodate slow acceleration changes, not a lot of jerk, which is uh, quick changes in acceleration, um, but it can do, it can make a huge difference. Um, the system that they have is called moving platform mode that you can actually turn on in the developer portal. And I'm betting if I refresh this, we can actually see the video they have on it. There we go. So with it off, you can see that everything is turned, everything is shaky, they're on a boat here. Um, and with it on, you can just continue to use it. The tracking is not quite as good for stationary if you have it turned on, well, oh well. Um, but it's amazing that you can use it in these new circumstances at all. Um, so let's look at our next assumption, and that is, I'll call it position. Um, the assumption of position, we, we grew up with an intuition that is, uh, stillness, that we're, we're sitting on the floor and it's holding still. Holding still actually isn't a meaningful concept, really, once you leave the Earth's surface. So, I mean, let's say we're in here using AR and we stick a hologram right in front of us, expecting to look at it. Uh, and you say, okay, I put a hologram right here, I'm gonna walk away, and it's still gonna be there. That doesn't actually mean anything. If you, if you watch videos of the astronauts on the ISS, you'll notice that they're constantly sort of drifting and touching things to maintain their position relative to something. It's all about relative position. So if you imagine this astronaut in their capsule moving this way relative to the capsule, well, Ignore that. Now the capsule's moving this way relative to the astronaut. Those are physically identical phenomenon. So our holograms really need, there, there is no stationary. So what we need to do is now design what are they stationary relative to? Am I augmenting something in front of the device? And it's stationary relative to the device. Am I augmenting a specific piece of equipment? And I need to make sure that it's stationary relative to the piece of equipment. And 
that gets you into design decisions that let you really pay attention to what is the thing being augmented. And you can use that to inform what do I need to attach these things to. Um, last, let's talk about um, orientation. So or orientation is, again, something we take for granted based on gravity. We are always saying, OK, I'm going to you know, read the word hello. It's always oriented in this vertical direction. Suddenly take away those assumptions. Can I do it? <laughs> Something like that, right? And that's just like a silly example, but you lose that straight up and down. Um, and then that quickly gets you into difficult cases where you say, OK, great. Now I just need to somehow orient it relative to the user. But what, what does that mean? How is this device working? And there's a lot of different edge cases that you have to come up with. For instance, every time I lilt my hand to the side and it gives you the sideways view, sorry about that, by the way. Uh, that is the accelerometer in here recognizing the downward direction and saying, oh, you must want to look at it this way now instead of this way. We don't have that when we are up in orbit. Um, and so you start to have to really think about, okay, what is the perspective that the user is going to have? How are they going to be handling the device? And then what other pieces are they going to have to deal with here? Um, so when we are augmenting construction sites, a lot of the time we need to specifically put up metadata about objects that we'll find around the site. And those objects might be all different sorts of sizes and shapes and positions relative to us. And so we get into this question of, OK, the user is looking at it from this perspective. They might be looking at roughly on this point. So do we pop up the metadata right there? No, that's going to cover up the object we're trying to look at. OK, so let's move it up and out of the way. OK, what's up? Well, <laughs> it can be up relative to gravity while we're here. Um, otherwise, then we need to say, maybe it's up relative to this device. What is up to the device? So we can start to get it up and out of the way, maybe toward the device. And then as that rotates, do we maintain that alignment relative to the device? Or how do, we, how do we hold on to that? Um, so then we can take this and very quickly start to see uh, parallels to the more terrestrial AR development uh, we are doing. I mean, the, you saw briefly before the GIF died, the um, moving platform mode from Microsoft and how now we're able to uh, have marine use cases or airborne or any kind of vehicle use cases, um, we get to the position. This is, I, I had a um, fun experience when my product was brand new where we were in a very large construction site and everyone had gone upstairs and I had to say, hang on, I'll be right back. I left my menu downstairs and I had to go walk, go around, find the menu because I had had you know, a button to make it follow me versus a button to have it hold still. I had it hold still, and then I couldn't reach the button to make it follow me. So like, you really get into these positional pieces. The orientation, we, we come up against that where, for example, the first iteration of this product's UI was this large stationary UI that expected you to be standing up in a wide open space. So you can you know, reach the things up high and have lots of room on your display. And we say, OK, well, yeah, it doesn't really work when you're sitting at your desk because it's designed for these large open spaces where you can stand up. Well, you can very quickly see an accessibility problem that is inherent there. Oh, yeah, you just have to stand up and walk over to it. You can't use it sitting down. That if we can look at each of these problems and try to imagine every possible way that every kind of person might be interacting with this, um, then I think we can have our stuff, our tools that we're making, much more ready for the real people that are going to be using them. 
Um, and I think, yeah, let's, let's take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a, a chance there to get information from the, uh, you know, the vehicle that you're in to help you uh, optimize the uh, stuff on the accelerometers? Yes. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of uh, technologies out there for getting positional data, at least, from um, the, from, from Bluetooth beacons or sonic beacons or things like that. The limitations that those tend to have is, one, they're, they're very positional focused in general. Um, there, there's no orientation and the problems you get with low latent or with high latency, poor latency uh, solutions, the, the biggest problems are turning and those aren't informing those very much. Also, I'm, I'm always hesitant to employ installation based solutions, especially in low infrastructure environments. You know, you don't have a AR specialist that you're sending to the space station. You have astronauts that have to be trained in a million things and how much uh, time do we want to give to that versus having it ready to go. Um, yeah, but the, the other piece is having better visual cues and using those, those like the SLAM-like technologies. I think that's the best way to use the environment to help out. Sure, sure, sure. I'm going to stop May we mirroring. see going up and down the elevator using the HoloLens? So this was last night, and I thought it was really interesting because I had, I'm on the 13th floor, you can see I started to go down and it drifts back up, but then it finds itself again because while the elevator is traveling through the middle floors, there's no acceleration except for just the standard acceleration of gravity. The, the velocity is consistent. And then when I get down to the bottom floor, now it's going to lose itself again and then refind itself after the elevator has stopped moving. So the problem is just the parts of acceleration, not velocity at all. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, how do people can use your, your tech? Is it some sort of a SDK, API? Uh, integratable, or is it something that you, uh, let's say, did just for like NASA, SpaceX? So um, our our technology is right now only exists within our application. We're just a small team, and we haven't gotten it out ready to uh, license yet. That is a long-term goal, um, but right now it just exists within the Argyle app. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we, we should talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One more question. Back to the uh, frame of reference problem. Do you know if there's anyone working on the situation where you're stationary, but the content around you is moving like maybe a manufacturing line at a factory? I don't know specifically of people working on um, like specific products working on that. The recommendation I would give for that kind of uh, situation would be to um, focus heavily on high contrast, like for instance, floor based. Um, because yeah, if you have enough pieces moving, you end up with the confusion, confusing the device of like, oh, all these things are moving. That said, a lot of these technologies are pretty good at recognizing you know, the majority of things are here and tend to agree with the IMUs and the filtering out those exceptional things. Like, I mean, if you put on one of these devices with people moving around in a crowd, it can get confused, but I'm impressed how well it does. Um, the other thing is the, the RISA alignment layer that we built, that one focuses a lot on accepting changes over time. Uh, but that's really focused on the long-term uh, healing that uh, alignment map. And yeah. Still take. 
at least two questions, so oh. we have still time. Oh, great, great, great. If there's any other questions. Have you, <clears throat> would the solution be applicable for terrestrial use cases like jumping out of airplanes or diving or um, like in like a flight simulator or something where your, your reference to gravity is always changing? Yes. I would say some of those more than others. So, um, I mean, jumping out of an airplane would actually be one of the easier ones as long as you can, you know, keep your headset on your head or <laughs> depending on what it is that you're actually trying to show. Uh, because in that case, you have one sort of inertial situation where you're in your airplane, then you jump out and it's a very gradual, it's like suddenly I'm free falling, then the air resistance starts to slow me down. So that's a pretty gradual change in acceleration. Um, something like a flight simulator, if it's more gradual, I think that would work really well. The problems you're gonna get into are those situations where acceleration changes very quickly. Where like, okay, I'm accelerating fast and then very suddenly not, it's not gonna be able to keep up with that super well. Um, those high jerk. Also, fun fact, the, the change in acceleration over time is called jerk. Change in jerk over time is called snap. And then it's crackle and then it's pop and those are actually the physics names for it and that's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Great stuff, thanks. Yeah. Um, marine environment, underwater, diving, that sounds like a somewhat of a subset, but also a unique set of problems. Oh, ab absolutely. And I think that the um, diving, diving is a, is a fun one because in a lot of ways you will end up with some of the, like it, it has the, the movement that you get with maybe a surface marine um, environment, like was shown in those GIFs but you also start to get some of those orientation problems because there's much less assumption of a ground plane, which we, I mean, how many AR apps have we tried out and the first thing you do is, okay, place your AR experience on the floor. Well, if there's, if there's no floor, how are, we, how are we assuming that that's gonna be the case? Where do you put these displays? How do you, what do you call stationary? I think that, yeah, a, a submarine, uh, an underwater environment would have a lot of the same issues as uh, microgravity, like in orbit. We can take one, one more. Any others? All right. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot.